All right. Um, in this video, we're going to see how to create a frequency distribution table, specifically a grouped frequency distribution table. And uh, we're looking at a hypothetical data set that has the age survival in months for a number of individuals. Uh, this is already data put into Excel and ordered, um, so we're not going to cover that. I'm uh, mainly just going to cover how to put it into the groups and set those up. Uh, one thing to notice is that there is too many numbers to just look at these and see the overall pattern, um, or to have each row in the frequency distribution be one of these values. Uh, most of them don't repeat, uh, and you don't want to have your table have too many rows. So uh, first thing we want to do then is take a look at the range of the data. And so that's just taking the largest number and then subtracting the smallest number. Um, here we can just kind of scroll down and see the largest number is 47 and the smallest number is 3. Right. And if your data is not ordered, I just go ahead and select that column and then click on the sort and filter sort smallest to largest in the toolbar. Now if your data set's really long, uh, it may take a while to scroll down. Um, you can actually put in a formula for this. Um, so it would do the max of this column. That'll find the biggest number and then subtract the min of this column and uh, you don't have to scroll all the way down there to see that the range is 44. All right, uh, the next thing we want to do is determine the class width. So the rows in the distribution table are known, we're going to put numbers into bins known as classes, and each one of those should be the same width. And the rule of thumb is that we should have 5 to 20 of those. So what I like to do is kind of go with 10 as a sort of middle number and we'll take and we'll divide the range by 10 and then we'll do some rounding with that. So uh, so an estimate of the class width is found just by dividing the range by 10 and we really want the class width to be a nice number so you want to think of not normal rounding rules, but rounding to nice numbers. So uh, whole numbers are nice, uh, and then if you can't have it be whole numbers, then obviously you're working with a grouped frequency table. Um, the next nice number to probably look at is uh, 5. Now, there are exceptions. That you, the real rule that supersedes all this is that we have between 5 and 20 rows in our table. So if going from 1 to 5 doesn't get in that range, then maybe a class width of 2 is appropriate. But usually you want to go right from 0 to 5. Um, and then up to 10, and then it's possible you could do 25, um, but probably go from 10 to maybe 50, and then up to 100. And so you can see we're doing, you know, sort of multiples of 10, but also the halfway points in those. So multiples of 10 are 10, 100, 1,000, uh, and then the halfway points would be 5, 50, and 500. Anyway, um, the actual class width here is pretty obvious now that we would just use 5. Now, we know our class width, um, we want to figure out where we're going to start the table, and the table has these classes, and the, it's basically an interval of numbers, right, of the lower limit and an upper limit. And the lower limit should, of the first class should be a multiple of the class width, but it also has to be less than the smallest number, the min of the data set. So you want to look at the min of the data set, in this case it's 3, and we want to find the largest multiple of the class width that's less than that. So in a class width of 5, the multiples are 0, 5, 10, 15, and so on. Um, the only one of those that's going to work, of course, is 0. But you don't mean you always start your class at 0. Um, if my first number was, say, 8, um, then I would actually have my first class start at 5, right? Um, and if my if my first number was, say, uh, 13, then I would have it start at 10. So it's a multiple of the class width, but it's got to be less than, that. so the, the, the largest multiple of the class width that is still less than the smallest number. Okay, uh, so we are now ready to set up this table, and so let's put it right here, I think. We can put it right here. Um, so we'll put in the uh, classes and their frequencies. 
All right, so the first class is going to start at 0, and it's going to go from 0 to uh, 4. So the classes have to be non-overlapping. So the class goes right up to 5, but it can't include 5, because really the class width is the difference between lower limits of consecutive classes. So this would be 5 to 9. And you can see the class width there by subtracting 0 and 5, or uh, 4 and 9 would get you the 5. And you can't have 5 twice because then if the number 5 appears, you don't know where to put it. Now, I'm using whole numbers here, but if there were decimals allowed, then this may need to be 4.9 or 4.99 as needed. So this should go right up to the, the largest number less than 5, um, but since they're all whole numbers, I can just use the whole number 4. Um, but it really is rolling right up to 5, but not including it. 5 is included in the second class. Now I continue this pattern until I get everything covered, so until a class includes the very last number, so 14. Uh, we know our um, last number is 47, so we're going to do a few more of these. Now, sometimes you get this thing where the, the next number, uh, say if the last number was 40, oh, it's, oh, we're actually not done yet, sorry. So this would be 40 to 44, and 45 to 49. So sometimes the last, very last number in the data set uh, is uh, the, the next number here. So if the last number in the data set was 45, it might make sense to just cut this class out and just have this go from 40 to 45. I know that breaks the rules a little bit, but most people are fine with that because um, it kind of helps the pattern a little more. So that is one exception to this rule um, where that last class can include this next number. Um, but of course you want to ask whoever you're working with to make sure that's okay. All right, so now we have the start of this table and we want to get these frequencies. So the frequency is just how many numbers fall into that class. Uh, now if you have the numbers here, you can just sort of move along. And what you do is you select the numbers. Again, they're already ordered. So select them, and then it'll tell you how many numbers you have if it's not obvious. So down in the bottom, it says count, and that's how many of the cells you've selected. So I would kind of go along picking those uh, numbers up, and so type those in too. Now I'm looking at five and nine, so I grab those. Uh, if you don't need to look down at count, that's fine. Um, but with large data sets, you may need to do this. Uh, 10 to 14, so that's 5. So notice the 5 there. 15 to 19, 7, 20 to 24, 5. 25 to 29, 7, 30 to 34, 6, 35 to 39, 2, 40 to 44, 3, and 47 minus 1. Now, you can definitely make mistakes doing this, so one way to check this is to have a total at the end and have Excel calculate the sum of these cells. Now that number, that 40, should match up with the sample size, which you can count, um, but you can also have this calculated by Excel. Size using the count command. So that gives us 40, um, and then you got to check is it actually counting this age survival in months? Um, so you can delete that away and notice it does not count that. So it's just counting ones with numbers in it, so it kind of knows what we're doing. Right, so you can have it do that, uh, count the whole column, and then it'll tell you. Right, so the 40 matching with that shows that we didn't make any mistakes in estimating these 
frequencies, and we now have a frequency distribution, which is a table showing how the numbers are distributed over these groups of five. Now, it's not too hard to get a relative frequency distribution from this. Um, we can create another column in this table, or we can actually uh, kind of repeat this table, because what we we'll ultimately want to do is maybe get a graph from each of these, and Excel doesn't like it if you have these three columned tables and you try to get a graph from it. So let's just change this to relative frequency. And then for each one of these, we can take the frequency and then we can divide by the sample size. Now, we want to copy this formula down and use the different frequencies in each row, which is good. It'll do that. But if you don't put an absolute reference dollar signs on this C4, it will move that down as well. We don't want that. So you can hit F4 and it'll put those dollar signs in, or you can just manually put in those dollar signs there. All right. And then once you have the formula in correctly, you can just double click in the corner and get all those. The relative frequency should add up to one. And if you want to display these as percentages, um, you can, if you think that that is more appropriate. So we now have a frequency distribution and a relative frequency distribution. Uh, the next thing we'll do would be to get histograms or bar graph versions of these, and uh, that's done in a, another video. So uh, go to that video so you can see the rest. Thank you.